Welcome to our Thursday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm nearing the end of my third week of teaching on the war is over, and I've got this little booklet that is an introduction to this. This is a 50-page booklet that summarizes this whole book on the war is over, and uh, this is entitled Goodwill Towards Men, and this is our free gift to you. We are asking for a donation of some amount towards the book. We also have CDs, DVDs, a USB, a study guide in English and in Spanish. We got a lot of material on this, but uh, I encourage you to please get these materials. This is based on Luke chapter 2, verse 14, where the angels were speaking to the shepherds and they said, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. And I've spent nearly three weeks showing that this isn't peace among men. Jesus himself said, Don't think I came to send peace on earth. I didn't come to send peace on earth, but to set a man at variance against his own family and father against the son and mother against the daughter. Jesus didn't come to bring peace among men. He came to bring peace from God towards man. The war is over. And I spent about two weeks trying to establish that the Old Testament law was a ministration of wrath, a ministration of condemnation where God's judgment and punishment was coming on people. In a sense, God was driving people to himself out of fear of punishment. Under the new covenant, he now is drawing people unto himself through love. Instead of using the fear motivation, he's using love motivation. And man, I've said a lot of things over the last three weeks about this. I haven't got time to go back through it, but that's what all of these materials are about. I encourage you to please get this because this is just essential that you understand this. And basically, the way that he was able to not impute man's sins unto them, not holding people's sins against them, is because he established a new covenant that was established upon new and better promises. I've already used that verse, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. Then in Hebrews chapter 9, I was showing under the old covenant that all of these pieces of the tabernacle were symbolic of something that applies to us in the New Testament except the cherubims that were overshadowing the mercy seat. They were there to protect it. And if anybody tried to enter into the presence of God, they would be struck dead. But that doesn't apply to us today. I talked about all of that yesterday. If you've missed any of that, please get hold of that. I hate to say these things because I know not everybody watches every single day and some of you are going to have no reference for what I'm talking about and this just went right over your head. But that is a powerful truth that no angel could stop us from entering directly into the throne room of God, into the very presence of God because Jesus has completely made a brand new living way through His death and resurrection. So that's in Hebrews chapter 9. Let me go down in verse 6. It says, Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. That's what I, I was talking about those things yesterday. And in verse 8, it says, The Holy Ghost thus signifying, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. In other words, the Old Testament did not really bring people into the very presence of God. It gave us a partial redemption. If we followed all of the sacrifices, if we obeyed and did all of these things, then we could have some degree of relationship with God. But the rest of this chapter is going to go on and talk about that we've got a new and living way, a better way to approach unto God to where our sins have been totally obliterated, past, present, and even sins that we haven't committed yet. Did you know that that statement right there sounds nearly like blasphemy to the average Christian? But if you'll stick with me as I read through these verses, it says this five different times in this ninth chapter of the book of Hebrews. And this is radical, and this is one of the reasons that most Christians are saved and stuck. They are just waiting on when we all get to heaven, in the sweet by and by, but in the rough now and now, they're struggling. They don't seem to have much of the joy and the victory and the power that the Bible promises to them. 
AND IT'S BECAUSE THEY ARE STILL ALLOWING THEIR SINS TO SEPARATE THEM FROM GOD. IN ISAIAH CHAPTER 59, THE LORD SAID HIS ARM WASN'T SHORTENED THAT IT CANNOT SAVE, NOR HIS EAR HEAVY THAT IT COULDN'T HEAR, BUT IT WAS YOUR SINS THAT IT SEPARATED BETWEEN YOU AND GOD. AND MOST CHRISTIANS TODAY ARE STILL FEELING THAT WAY. I MAY NOT GO TO HELL BECAUSE I'VE MADE JESUS MY LORD, BUT I CAN'T EXPECT ANY VICTORY. I CAN'T EXPECT GOD TO HEAL ME. I CAN'T EXPECT PROSPERITY, JOY, PEACE, RELATIONSHIP WITH GOD BECAUSE I'VE JUST FAILED HIM SO BADLY. SEE, THAT'S AN OLD COVENANT MENTALITY. UNDER THE NEW COVENANT, YOU NOW HAVE ACCESS TO GOD THROUGH A NEW AND LIVING WAY THROUGH THE FLESH OF JESUS, AND IT'S NOT BASED ON YOUR PERFORMANCE. IT'S BASED ON WHAT JESUS DID FOR YOU. SO HE GOES ON TO SAY THIS IN THE REST OF THIS CHAPTER. IN VERSE 9, IT SAYS, WHICH WAS A FIGURE. ALL OF THESE OLD TESTAMENT SACRIFICES WERE A FIGURE FOR THE TIME THEN PRESENT IN WHICH WERE OFFERED BOTH GIFTS AND SACRIFICES, THAT COULD NOT MAKE HIM THAT DID THE SERVICE PERFECT AS PERTAINING TO THE CONSCIENCE, WHICH STOOD ONLY IN MEATS AND DRINKS AND DIVERS' WASHINGS AND CARNAL ORDINANCES IMPOSED UPON THEM UNTIL THE TIME OF REFORMATION. THIS IS TALKING ABOUT WHEN JESUS CAME AND BROUGHT IN A NEW COVENANT. AND YET, SAD TO SAY, MOST CHRISTIANS ARE STILL LIVING UNDER THE OLD COVENANT MENTALITY AND THE WAY OF APPROACHING GOD LIKE THEY DID IN THE OLD TESTAMENT. IN VERSE 11, IT SAYS, BUT CHRIST BEING COME AND HIGH PRIEST OF GOOD THINGS TO COME BY A GREATER AND MORE PERFECT TABERNACLE, NOT MADE WITH HANDS, THAT IS TO SAY, NOT OF THIS BUILDING, NEITHER BY THE BLOOD OF GOATS AND CALVES, BUT BY HIS OWN BLOOD HE ENTERED IN ONCE INTO THE HOLY PLACE, HAVING OBTAINED ETERNAL REDEMPTION FOR US. DO YOU KNOW, AGAIN, YOU NEED TO TAKE THIS IN CONTEXT. THE FIRST FEW VERSES, WE WERE TALKING ABOUT THE DIFFERENCE BETWEEN THE HOLY PLACE AND THE HOLY OF HOLIES WHERE THE ARK OF THE COVENANT AND THE PRESENCE OF GOD WAS AND THAT IF ANYBODY SOUGHT TO ENTER IN THERE, THEY WOULD BE STRUCK DEAD. AND SO YOU NEED THAT CONTEXT AND YOU NEED TO UNDERSTAND ALL OF THESE THINGS IN ITS PROPER ORDER. AGAIN, PLEASE GET THIS BOOK THAT WILL GO INTO MORE DETAIL AND PUT THIS IN ITS PROPER PERSPECTIVE. BUT NOTICE IN THIS 12TH VERSE, IT SAYS IT WASN'T BY THE BLOOD OF GOATS AND CALVES. THOSE ARE THE OLD TESTAMENT SACRIFICES. BUT BY HIS OWN BLOOD, SPEAKING OF JESUS, HE ENTERED IN ONCE INTO THE HOLY PLACE, HAVING OBTAINED ETERNAL REDEMPTION FOR US. THESE ARE RADICAL, RADICAL STATEMENTS THAT ARE COMPLETELY CONTRARY TO THE WAY THINGS WERE DONE IN THE OLD COVENANT. IN THE OLD COVENANT, YOU HAD A DAY OF ATONEMENT ONCE A YEAR WHERE ALL OF THE SINS OF THE WHOLE NATION WERE ATONED FOR. BUT THEN EVERY TIME YOU HAD ALL KINDS OF THINGS HAPPEN. EVERY TIME THERE WAS A NEW MOON, THERE HAD TO BE A SACRIFICE. EVERY TIME YOU COMMITTED A SIN, YOU HAD TO BRING A SACRIFICE TO ATONE FOR THAT SIN. EVERY TIME YOU HAD A CHILD, YOU HAD TO HAVE A SACRIFICE. EVERY TIME A WOMAN HAD A uh, CHILD, SHE HAD TO BRING A SACRIFICE. THIS WAS REFLECTED IN JOSEPH AND uh, MARY GOING INTO THE TEMPLE WITH JESUS AFTER THE DAYS OF HER PURIFICATION. THERE WAS JUST ALL OF THIS CONSTANT uh, SHEDDING OF BLOOD. DID YOU KNOW AT THE DEDICATION OF THE TEMPLE, uh, SOLOMON SACRIFICED, I THINK IT WAS 120,000 SHEEP AND 22,000 OXEN AND THINGS LIKE THIS. THERE WAS ALL OF THESE SACRIFICES THAT HAD TO BE OFFERED, BUT IN CONTRAST TO ALL OF THAT, THE REASON THAT THOSE THINGS HAD TO BE DONE OVER AND OVER AND OVER IS BECAUSE NO ANIMAL COULD EVER ATONE FOR OUR SINS. IT WAS ONLY SYMBOLIC. THE BIBLE SAYS IN ROMANS 6, 23 THAT THE WAGES OF SIN IS DEATH. THAT'S JUST ANOTHER WAY OF SAYING WHAT JESUS SAID OVER IN GENESIS CHAPTER TWO WHEN HE TOLD ADAM, HE SAYS, IN THE DAY YOU EAT OF THAT FRUIT, YOU SHALL SURELY DIE. THERE WAS A DEATH PENALTY UPON SIN. BUT UNDER THE OLD COVENANT, BECAUSE OF THE MERCY AND THE GRACE OF GOD, GOD ALLOWED US TO SUBSTITUTE AN ANIMAL FOR OUR OWN DEATH. ULTIMATELY, YOU HAVE TO PAY FOR YOUR OWN SINS, AND SO GOD GAVE THIS ANIMAL THAT WAS SYMBOLIC OF JESUS BECOMING THE LAMB OF GOD WHO WOULD TAKE AWAY THE SINS OF THE WORLD. BUT IT HAD TO BE REPEATED OVER AND OVER BECAUSE THE SYMBOLISM, THOSE ANIMALS COULD NEVER REALLY PAY FOR OUR SINS. THEY WERE ONLY SYMBOLIC, AND THE SYMBOLISM HAD TO BE KEPT CONSTANTLY IN FRONT OF US THAT EVERY TIME WE'VE SINNED, WE DESERVE TO DIE. 
And this isn't only talking about the big 10, you know, like the 10 commandments when you sin, but the scripture says in James chapter 2 verse 10, if you keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, you become guilty of all. So we just constantly are failing to be the people that God intended us to be. James chapter 4 verse 17 says, To him that knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. So sin isn't only when you transgress a direct commandment of God. Sin is when you fail to be the person that God wants you to be. And all of us fail to be the way that we should. Romans chapter 14 verse 23, the latter part of that verse says, Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Did you know every time you get out of faith, every time you get into fear, every time you get into unbelief, that's sin. And if we were living under the old covenant, there would have to be a constant shedding of blood, an animal being substituted to remind us that because of these sins, death is what you deserve. That would be justice. And God, under, his, under the old covenant, because of His mercy, allowed us to substitute an animal. But it was only a picture, a type, a shadow of Jesus dying for our sin. But now that Jesus has come, and Jesus died. He doesn't have to do this over and over and over because His one sacrifice for sins dealt with sins forever. That's what this is saying in verse 12. Again, let me read this. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, which was only symbolic and therefore had to be repeated, but by His own blood He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Man, that is awesome. You know, if you for some reason are watching this program and you have never made Jesus your personal Savior and Lord, if you, you might believe that He exists. You might believe He was a good man. But if you have never submitted yourself and made Him your Lord and put your faith in Him, then this doesn't apply to you. He paid for your sins, but it, it doesn't set you free until you mix it with faith. It says in Romans chapter 5, verse 2, that we have access into this grace through faith. And so you have to put faith in Jesus. If you have never made Jesus your personal Lord, then someday you will have to answer for your own sins, and the wages of sin is death, eternal separation from God. But if you have made Jesus your Lord, then He entered in one time, once, into the holy place, and He obtained eternal redemption for you. You know, again, I've mentioned this before, but there are some Pentecostal groups that believe that you are forgiven of your sins up until the time you get born again. And when you make Jesus your Lord, all of your past is wiped out. But then every time you sin after that as a Christian, and again, this has to be defined some way because some people think sin is only when you do something really, really bad. No, sin is failing to be the person you're supposed to be. If you know to do good and don't do it, that's sin, James 4, 17. If you operate in unbelief, it says that whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So if you use a Bible definition of sin, it's not only when you do something terrible, a great transgression against God, but it's just failing to be the person that you're supposed to be. Anytime you fail to operate in faith, that's sin. And there are some people that believe that if you have any unconfessed sin in your life, and if you were to die like through some tragic thing where you didn't have time to repent, if you died in a car wreck, even though you might have been born again for 20 years, 30 years or whatever, if you had an unconfessed sin, and you died in a car wreck before you had time to confess it, you would die and go to hell. That's what some of the Pentecostal groups believe. I tell you, if I believed that, then the moment you got born again, I'd kill you. <laughs> I might go to hell, but that's the only way you'd ever get to heaven. If you had to have every single sin confessed, and again, just every time that you fail to operate in faith, whatsoever is not a faith is sin, it would be impossible to live that way. And there are some people that honestly are living under this kind of a doctrine that they have no boldness, no confidence, no assurance that they have a guaranteed relationship with God. A lesser interpretation, but still imputing sin to people, is that no, if you were born again, and if you were to die in a car wreck or something, and if you had an unconfessed sin, 
in your life. You wouldn't go to hell, but you would be denied uh, fellowship with God. You would be denied answers to prayer. God won't use you. I've heard people say many, many times and say, God won't use a dirty vessel. I want you to know God hadn't got any other kind of vessel to use. <laughs> and we're all in varying stages of being less than what we're supposed to be. You know, I've lived a super holy life. I really have. I've never said a word of profanity. I've never taken a drink of liquor. I've never smoked a cigarette. Man, I have lived a super, super holy life compared to other people. But who wants to be the best sinner that ever went to hell? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I cannot stand before God based on my own goodness. And until I got this revelation that He entered in once into the holy place and obtained eternal redemption, not redemption until the next time that I sinned and then I had to get born again again. I had to get somehow or another saved again. Some people, their Christian life is they get born again, they're saved and then they're lost and then they're saved again and they repent and they're just like a yo-yo up and down. There is no way for you to have a consistent relationship with God with that kind of thinking. Again, if this, if this verse means anything, if words mean anything, this says that Jesus entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Not momentary redemption. Not redemption just until you got, uh, you know, until the next time that you sin, and then you got to confess that, and you got to get that sin under the blood. You know, I know that this is raising a question about what about 1 John 1, 9? If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'm going to answer that, but I'm not going to have time to answer it today. You need to get this teaching. It will go into detail and it will explain that. But let me just continue reading here. It says in verse 13, For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify to the purifying of the flesh. This is talking about if the way that people approach God under the old covenant gave them some degree of redemption and freedom from their sin. In verse 14, How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Man, that, that is loaded with truth and revelation. Again, I hadn't got time to go into that. You know, these little 30-minute programs are really hard in a sense to share these truths because it raises as many questions as it answers, and I just don't have time to answer all of these things in one broadcast. I've got a book entitled, Who Told You That You Were Naked? And uh, that is a quotation from Genesis chapter 3, verse 11, where God said to Adam, He said to Adam, He says, Who told you that you were naked? So that's a scripture. God Himself said that. God's not the one who told him he was naked. Satan didn't tell him he was naked. It was his own conscience that told him he was naked. And our conscience is what condemns us. And so this is what this is talking about. In verse 14, that how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Did you know if your conscience isn't purged, if you are constantly still bearing about this sin consciousness, it'll keep you from serving God. So you've got to get your conscience purged, and that's what that teaching on the who told you that you were naked is all about. In verse 15, it says, And for this cause He, Jesus, is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. In verse 12, it talked about eternal redemption. Now in verse 15, it talks about eternal inheritance through the one offering of Jesus. Once. Again, most Christians believe that they are forgiven up until the point that they get born again, and then after they get born again, every time they sin, that is a new transgression against God, and it's got to get under the blood that it's a new affront, it's a new offense against God, and that God will withdraw from us. This is saying that Jesus dealt with your sins once. Once. 
FOR ALL TIME. LOOK AT IT THIS WAY. JESUS DIED FOR OUR SINS 2,000 YEARS AGO. HE DIDN'T DIE FOR YOUR SINS. LIKE, I GOT BORN AGAIN IN 1957. JESUS DIDN'T DIE FOR MY SINS IN 1957. HE DIED FOR MY SINS 2,000 YEARS BEFORE THAT, BEFORE I'D EVEN COMMITTED ANY SINS. DID YOU KNOW THAT JESUS FORGAVE ALL OF OUR SINS, PAST, PRESENT, AND EVEN FUTURE tense SINS? AND SOME PEOPLE SAY, HOW CAN GOD FORGIVE A SIN BEFORE YOU COMMIT IT? WELL, he, HE ONLY DIED ONE TIME FOR OUR SINS 2,000 YEARS AGO, AND HE'S NEVER DIED SINCE THEN. DID YOU KNOW ALL OF YOUR SINS, ALL OF MY SINS WERE FUTURE SINS WHEN JESUS DIED? HE'S DIED FOR ALL OF OUR SINS. WHEN JESUS PAID FOR OUR SINS, HE DIDN'T JUST PAY FOR OUR SINS UP UNTIL THE POINT WE GOT BORN AGAIN, AND THEN AFTER WE'RE BORN AGAIN, WE'VE GOT TO GET EACH SIN UNDER THE BLOOD. THAT'S A PHRASE THAT CHRISTIANS WILL USE A LOT, THAT YOU NEED TO REPENT OF THAT SIN AND GET THAT SIN UNDER THE BLOOD. YOU'VE GOT TO GET JESUS' BLOOD REAPPLIED TO YOU EVERY TIME YOU SIN. YOU KNOW, IT GOES ON TO SAY HERE IN HEBREWS CHAPTER 10, LET ME JUST READ THIS. HEBREWS CHAPTER 10, VERSE 12, IT SAYS, BUT THIS MAN, SPEAKING ABOUT JESUS, AFTER HE HAD OFFERED ONE SACRIFICE FOR SINS FOREVER, SAT DOWN ON THE RIGHT HAND OF GOD. THIS PICTURES JESUS COMPLETING SALVATION IN SUCH A WAY THAT NOW HE IS JUST SEATED AT THE RIGHT HAND OF GOD THE FATHER. HE'S NOT WORKING. HE'S NOT DOING SOMETHING TO SAVE YOU. HE DID THAT 2,000 YEARS AGO. HE'S NOW SEATED, AND ALL WE ARE DOING IS APPROPRIATING WHAT HE HAS ALREADY DONE. IF EVERY TIME A CHRISTIAN SINNED, THEY HAD TO GET THAT SIN UNDER THE BLOOD, THE BLOOD REAPPLIED TO THEM. IF JESUS HAD TO SOMEHOW OR ANOTHER REAPPLY THE BLOOD TO THEIR LIFE TO CLEANSE THEM AND MAKE THEM SO THAT THEY COULD WORSHIP GOD, THERE WOULD BE NO SUCH THING AS GOD SITTING AT THE FATHER'S RIGHT HAND. HE WOULD BE CONSTANTLY JUST REAPPLYING THE BLOOD AS MILLIONS AND MILLIONS OF CHRISTIANS EVERY SINGLE DAY ARE CONFESSING TWO AND THREE TIMES A DAY THEIR SINS AND THEIR SHORTCOMINGS. THERE WOULD BE NO SUCH THING AS JESUS SITTING AT THE FATHER'S RIGHT HAND. THAT IS NOT TRUE. THIS MINDSET IS NOT TRUE. JESUS DIED FOR ALL SINS OF THE ENTIRE HUMAN RACE, ALL TIMES PAST TO ALL TIMES FUTURE. HE DIED AND MADE ONE PAYMENT FOR ALL SINS, FOR ALL TIMES. AND SINCE THAT TIME, FOR THOSE WHO ACCEPT IT, THEY HAVE ETERNAL REDEMPTION AND ETERNAL INHERITANCE, NOT JUST REDEMPTION AND INHERITANCE UNTIL THE NEXT TIME THEY SIN. I WANT TO THANK YOU FOR WATCHING OUR YOUTUBE CHANNEL AND THE PROGRAMS THAT WE HAVE AVAILABLE. AND I WANT TO ENCOURAGE YOU THAT YOU CAN GET THE MATERIALS THAT WE'VE OFFERED. ALSO, I'D LIKE TO ENCOURAGE YOU TO LIKE OUR PROGRAM AND SUBSCRIBE TO WHAT WE'RE DOING. WE HAVE A LOT OF MATERIAL, AND I BELIEVE IT'LL BE A REAL BLESSING TO YOU. SO THANK YOU FOR BEING A PART OF IT. GOD BLESS YOU.